Well, wonderful to be with you this morning. We're coming just on the other side of a, a sermon series in the fall titled Cast Your Light, where we've been talking together as the people of God, how can we as ambassadors of Jesus cast our light to shine the light of the gospel in our community and in the lives of those around us that we know, love, and care for. We talked that we are sent out as ambassadors in order to proclaim and to demonstrate that kingdom. And so as we come on the other side of that series, we're going to begin a new series today where we're looking in towards Thanksgiving and uh, want to be reminded of all the blessings that we have through our union with Christ. This is entitled, Forget Not All of His Benefits. Now, as it often can happen, you, you have the, the best laid out plans and then things get introduced that put a little bit of wrench here and there in it. And that is kind of, at least in my own mind and thinking, has has happened, not to say wrench, but just, that is, there's certain world events going on right now that um, I think you're probably thinking about, and I've been thinking about, and what I hope that we can do, at least in some measure, is still continue to explore in the pulpit together, in the Word of God, the benefits of what it means to be united with Christ, but also to do so with a mindfulness of what's happening in our world today. You see, just over the last number of weeks, we all know about the war that has erupted in the Middle East. And that's not necessarily anything new. You know, there's been war all throughout, for sure, you know. But this feels maybe a bit different to many because one of the nations that's involved in that conflict is called Israel. And so that just heightens things, and we think about it maybe a little bit differently. And so I hope that we can explore some of that a little bit. Now, what I don't want to do, and nor do I feel comfortable doing it, and in any way, nor should I do it, and that is to be up here as a preacher in order to uh, give words from the Lord on geopolitical matters. It's not necessarily anything, but let's just say over this last week, I spent some significant time trying to educate myself over the complexity of the situation that has erupted over in the Middle East. And at least for me, that goes back at least 150 years to the Zionist movements in the late 19th century up and through today. Now, what I realized in that study is it's a lot more complicated, a lot more going on than I originally knew, and it also realized I don't think I'm the person to sit up here and go, here's what you should all think about that. But I do think it would be of benefit for us to, together as the people of God, think about what's happening biblically and theologically. What are some things the Word of God would help us understand about what's happening in our world today? And I hope that we can do that. One of the expectations that many people have over what's happening in the Middle East and then in the country of nation of Israel is an expectation that God is regathering His people, the Jews, in the land and that through this ingathering of the people into the land, that this is sort of ushering or hastening towards the return of Christ. In other words, this war can sometimes, have, you know, bring along with it eschatological dimensions to it. Because the expectation is, is that just at or just prior to the return of Jesus, there will be a mass conversion a mass conversion of ethnic Jews to Christ. And that is part of God's fulfilling prophecies that His people would be regathered and there be this massive conversion just prior to the return of Jesus. That's what I hope we can explore together this morning. Are you with me? Now, I'm going to tell you right up front, I'm going to ask a lot of you today. You happen to have a Bible nerd as a pastor this is a Bible nerd sermon. If you're a… well, you, you say that now, okay? You might not be clapping at the end. Um, what I'm going to ask of you is to work with me, be with me, put on your thinking caps and work with this, through this with me, because I think there's a lot that God would want to show us in His Word 
as we look at the passage of Scripture where this expectation is derived. This expectation of this future mass conversion is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 11. And that's what we're going to be studying together or looking at or unpacking together is Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. So I invite you to stand. So we read this together. If you're new to Cornerstone, we stand in honor of the Word of God, in honor of its reading. It's three verses, chapter 11 of Romans 25 through 27. Lest you be wise in your own sight, says the Apostle Paul. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins." Though the grass withers and the flower fades, the Word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated and let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that it is true. We thank You that we can trust it. We thank You that it molds and shapes us. We pray, Holy Spirit, that You'd be present with us to open up our eyes that we can see, our ears that we would hear, our hearts that we would understand, turn and be healed as You are present with us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we said, opening up our time together, this sermon series is focused on the benefits of union with Christ. And so this morning, our message is entitled, Our Living Hope. And I hope that we can unpack together this morning that the hope that we have as believers in Jesus is that our Lord Jesus Christ has fulfilled all the promises that God made to His people. God, Jesus is the fulfillment of the promises of God to His people, and those promises have now been extended to you and to me, and we with, live within the sphere or scope of those promises which Jesus fulfilled. And that we want to see is that Romans 11, that what we just read, this passage that we just looked at, is Paul unpacking part of how Jesus fulfills the promises of God to His people. Now, before we jump in, I want to tell you the two primary ways this passage of Scripture has been understood through church history. Now, there's been more than two. We're going to look at two primary ways. One, the first one, has been the primary understanding of this passage through most of church history. And the second one we'll look at is the one that has come to prominence in about the last 150 years. The first one, again, the one that has been prominent through most of church history, is called the ecclesiastical view. What this view says is that when Paul uses the phrase, all Israel, in Romans 11, verse 26, that term is equal to or equivalent to the church. This view equates Israel and the church, and it argues against defining the use of the word Israel in Romans 11 as an ethnic term for ethnic Jews. And it does this based on a reading of Romans 9, verse 6, where the Apostle Paul says, not all Israel is Israel. And so, based on this understanding, when Paul says all Israel will be saved, it's basically saying that all of the church will be saved. Now, that's one view. The other view has come to prominence, as we said, over the last 150 years. I'm going to make an assumption, and you know what they say about that, (laughs) that most people this morning hold this second view. And if you're joining us online, I'm making an assumption you probably hold this second view of this passage of Scripture in Romans 11. It's referred to as the eschatological miracle view. It's the view that we were mentioning earlier before our reading. This view says that there is a future salvation of all or most ethnic Jews. So that's what separates it in a large measure from the previous view, which says that when he uses the phrase, all Israel, it's not an ethnic term. This would say that it is that the salvation of all or most ethnic Jews will happen immediately or just prior to the return of Jesus. 
This happens, quote, after the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and then the Jews will finally be saved through a mass conversion to Christ. This understanding has, has a way of reading Scripture where God has made promises to ethnic Israel, ethnic Jews. And therefore, for those promises to have integrity, those promises must be fulfilled to ethnic Jews. And that the fulfillment that God has made to ethnic Israel will be fulfilled in the future. But that in the meantime, there has been a parenthesis in God's plan to fulfill His promises to the Jews, and that is now called the time of either the church or the Gentiles. But now we are under the time where God has focused His attention as a parenthesis in those plans to ethnic Israel to us, the church. And that in a time, depending on how you understand it, maybe in the very near future, God will act in order to remove the church in order that He would then refocus His plans to fulfill His promises to ethnic Israel. And that removal of the church is referred to as the rapture. So the rapture is the mechanism by which God takes the church away in order to refocus His uh, salvation promises that He made to ethnic Israel. Are you with me? And I'm going to assume that many, many, many people would say amen to what I just said. (laughs) Fair enough. Now, what I'm going to suggest this morning is that neither one of those readings is the most faithful reading of Romans 11. Now, as we go there, as we unpack this, we want to keep in mind some principles of faithful interpretation of Scripture. This is something that we want to keep in mind not only in reading Romans 11, but in reading any passage of Scripture in order to faithfully interpret its meaning. One is that the author's message carries the authority of the text. What that means is, is what the Apostle Paul meant to say is the meaning of the text. If you and I were to come up with a meaning or an interpretation, and somehow the Apostle Paul was here, and he was to hear our interpretation or hear our meaning, and he was to scratch his head and go, hmm, that's very interesting, we would know that's not the meaning. Whatever the meaning is, is what Paul meant when he said it. Now, along with that, we also want to interpret in a way that recognizes that when Paul wrote, did Paul write in English? Okay. So, the author's message is couched within the language and the culture of the time of the author when he wrote it. So, in order to understand the meaning of the author, we also want to understand the culture and the language that the author used. And as we give readings for texts… We want to be able to support our reading with evidence. We want to be able to say, here's our meaning, this is what we believe the meaning to be, and we believe the meaning to be this on the basis of this, on the basis of that. And as we have evidence, that helps support our reading as we seek to be faithful to the original author's meaning. Are you with me? Okay. What we are going to attempt to do this morning is to do that with Romans 11, verses 25 through 27. What did Paul mean? How can we see that he meant that given the original language and culture, and how can we give evidence that support it? Now, if we're going to do that, as we will, we want to recognize that Romans 11 comes within a certain stream of thought from the Apostle Paul and a block of Scripture that really begins with Romans 9. So, Romans 9 through 11 is really one thought or one, you know, ongoing argument from the Apostle Paul. And Romans 9 through 11 is about this question. If Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, why did so many Jews reject him? Do you think that's a, that's a worthwhile question? So if you're trying to present the gospel to Gentiles saying Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, I mean, a very, very good question is, well, if he's the Jewish Messiah, why aren't more Jews believing in him? That's what Romans 9 through 11 is about. And so he opens up in Romans 9 saying, Paul saying, I am burdened for my people. I am uh, 
say, he, he says, I, I would almost rather be cut off from the promises of Jesus that they would know Him. He says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I wish that I myself were cursed, and I would be cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people, the ethnicity, the people of Israel. But Paul wants to make clear, and he's going to unpack over these chapters, but it's not as if God's Word has failed, that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, and being the Jewish Messiah, the Messiah for Israel, He is the Messiah of the world, and He's unpacking that in these chapters. And at the end of Romans 11, which our verses are towards the end, it's kind of almost like a bookend, we're looking at the beginning of Romans 9, we're looking now at the end of Romans 11, He supports and He he unpacks and says, look, the promise that we're saying about the salvation of all Israel is according to God's Word. And he quotes it from Isaiah. The deliverer will come from Zion, and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So Paul is saying God is fulfilling His words in the salvation of Israel as is written. Now, just a couple things before we jump on. What is Zion or where is Zion? Jerusalem and specifically the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The deliverer will come from Zion and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. Who is the deliverer? Jesus. Now, what does Jesus do? Jesus renews the covenant. Now, remember, this is Jesus in the upper room with his disciples. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus renews the covenant with His people, and what does Jesus say that covenant does, at least in part? Take away the sins of the people. This is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. So what Paul is saying is is that the salvation to all Israel comes as a fulfillment of the Word of God. So let's look at our text again. What we want to do is, because as we said, if we're going to have faithful readings, we don't know what did Paul mean, which is couched in his own language and culture. What does Paul mean by this phrase, all Israel? If we don't know what this means, then we will not understand what he meant. Because we make an assumption. We already said we know about assumptions. And the assumption is this, that the word Jew and the phrase all Israel mean the same thing. They're equivalent terms. So if God saves the Jews and God saves all Israel, He's saying the same thing when that's not true. The word Jew and the phrase all Israel do not mean the same thing. Notice in the book of Romans, up and through chapter 8, He doesn't use the word Israel. He uses the word Jew. Now, the word Jew, or in Greek, eudaioi, is a term that was used to reference a people that began to be used in a particular point in Israel's history. You see, during the history of Israel, the kingdom of Israel was broken up into two. You remember this? There was a northern kingdom. The northern kingdom was referred to as either Israel or Ephraim, and the southern kingdom was referred to as Judah. Now, in the year 586, the kingdom of Babylon came and overran, destroyed, and deported the people of the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, when that happened, people began to refer to them with the term hoi eudaioi. And what that term means is a Judean, a Judean. This is, we see this all through the early Jewish writings in between Malachi and Matthew. We see this in through the first century. As an example, the uh, Jewish historian Josephus, who was a contemporary of the Apostle Paul, says it explicitly. From the day they went up from Babylon, they were called by that name, in Greek, hoi eudaioi, the Jews after the tribe of Judah. So this is a term that means Judean. 
So in a way, we could go through our New Testament, and every time it says the word Jews, we could replace that with Judeans. They are the remnant of Judah, those that either stayed or came back from Babylon. They are from the tribe of Judah. Now, here's another Bible nerd question for you. How many tribes of the original 12 compose the southern tribe of Judah? Two. Which ones? Judah and Benjamin. That's why the apostle Paul refers to himself as a Benjamite, because he was of the people of the Judeans who returned from Babylon under King Cyrus, the Persian. Now, that is in distinction to the phrase, all Israel. All Israel is not in reference to the southern kingdom of Judah and the remnant of those who came back who were referred to as Judeans. That actually the phrase, all Israel, is a technical term that when it is used in the Hebrew Scriptures, always means the same thing. And what it always means is a reference to all twelve tribes. In the Old Testament, the expression all Israel relates exclusively to the tribal structure of the descendants of Jacob slash Israel. Obviously, Jacob is Israel. So, in a technical sense, all Israel specifically refers to all 12 tribes as a whole. Can you see how the term Jew is different from the phrase all Israel? So, here in our text, Paul uses this technical phrase, and he says that all Israel will be saved. It's not without reason, as we'll see, that Paul calls this a mystery. Because to remind ourselves of the history of Israel, that there was originally kings under a united kingdom, beginning with Saul, into David, and into Solomon, and then to Rehoboam, at what time the kingdom split. And as we said, how many tribes were in the south? How many tribes were in the north? Ten. Now, something tragic happens in the year 722 to the northern kingdom. As a result of their sin, what happens? They are deported by the kingdom of Assyria. So, this is the ancient Near East, the kind of the fertile crescent. At the top, you have the kingdom of Assyria, and towards the bottom of Babylon. Assyria, in the year 722, destroys and deports the northern kingdom of Israel, which is also referred to as Ephraim. Now, the thing about the Assyrians is they had a specific methodology when they destroyed other kingdoms, when they conquered other kingdoms, and how they subjugated the people. Their strategy for subjugation was a process by which they took the people of the land and they exported them, and they took people from other lands and imported them. Now, there's a reason why they did that. The reason why they did that is they wanted to assimilate and to destroy the identity of the people that they had conquered. And you can see why you think that would be helpful to subjugate a people if you can destroy their identity. And so they do this. This is very much like any Star Trek fans. The Assyrians are like the Borg, okay? You know, they come in in a giant cube, and they say, resistance is futile, and they assimilate them. Is it successful? Is Assyria, is Assyria successful in the assimilation and really the destruction of the identity of the ten northern tribes? Yes. Which is why they were referred to as the ten lost tribes. What happened to them? Well, they were merged in and basically became one with the nations. Unless you're Mormon, then they ended up somehow in North America. But we aren't Mormon. <laughs> right? So these tribes are gone. They are gone. Now, this is different than the southern tribe of Judah because when Babylon comes in, they don't have the same strategy. 
They don't subjugate the people in the same way the Assyrians did. And so the southern tribe of Judah, or the Judeans, or the Hoi Udaioi, the Judeans, the Jews, are able to maintain their identity. They aren't blended in, and so when they come back, they come back as Jews, are referred to as Judeans, and they comprise the two tribes of Benjamin and Judah. Now, the reason why this is important is because of the nature of the promises that God made. All along, we're saying this sermon is about God fulfilling His promises to His people. Now, in the book of Jeremiah, God makes some amazing promises. Now, to remind ourselves something, are you with me? Are you staying with me? Okay. Jeremiah was writing at the same time that the southern kingdom is being attacked by Babylon. That's about 150 years after the northern kingdom has been destroyed and it's gone. To put that in perspective, it's like it's been about as long as if today to uh, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, 1865. So think about how long ago was Abraham Lincoln killed in the Civil War? Long time ago? Does it feel like a long time? That's how long it's been since the northern kingdom is gone and Jeremiah's writing. It's been that long. Now, Jeremiah is a depressing book. Okay, I would not recommend reading Jeremiah in winter in Michigan. It's not a good idea. It's already depressing enough. But there is a section of Jeremiah that's referred to as the book of comfort. This is Jeremiah chapter 30 through 33, and has some very famous passages or well-known passages as they are used in the New Testament, quoted by the apostles. And the book of comfort talks about the renewal that God is bringing to His people, and He makes promises. Now, check this out. He opens up with this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah. Okay, so if you're in Jerusalem at the time of Jeremiah and you go, okay, I'll restore the fortunes of my people, Judah. Yeah, that makes sense. But how can you restore the fortunes of Israel, the northern ten tribes? You can't send a telegram to the leader of the tribe of Naphtali. It doesn't exist. They are gone. And yet God promises to restore them. In Jeremiah 31, behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the ten tribes that don't exist, and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made before when I took them out of Egypt, my covenant that they broke though I was their husband. What prophet does that make you think of? Hosea. Remember, what I, remember, Hosea was a prophet to the north. Remember what Hosea's kids, you know, you didn't want those names, right, with Gomer? One of their names was, not my people. And he sends them away a certificate of divorce. But yet God promises to restore them. How is that possible? Look in, look in Jeremiah 31, verse 15. Again, a, a passage quoted in the New Testament. It says, thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted. Why? Because they don't exist. Remember, who? Rachel was the wife of who? Who was Rachel's husband? Jacob, whose name later was changed to Israel. Jacob had an older sister whose name was Leah. This is a Bible nerd sermon. Rachel had how many kids? Two. And their names were firstborn, Joseph, secondborn, Benjamin. Now, the most famous of those would be Joseph. Now, Joseph had how many kids? Two. First name, firstborn was named Manasseh, secondborn was named Ephraim. Now, what was the northern tribes referred to as? Ephraim. So we see that Rachel is weeping. Why? Because the children of Rachel are gone. They do not exist. Ephraim is gone. The ten northern tribes have become the nations. There is no distinction, and yet God promises to restore them. Are you with me? This is why the Apostle Paul says, this is a mystery, brothers. This is a mystery. How can God restore all? all Israel, a technical term for all 12 tribes, when 10 of them don't exist. And here's how God will do it. 
He says he will do it in this way. Here's how all 12 tribes will be restored. They, all 12 tribes will be restored by bringing in the fullness of the Gentiles. This is the mechanism. Now, why does Paul say that it's the fullness of the Gentiles that brings in the salvation of all 12 tribes? The reason why is because Paul is quoting, this phrase is a quote, from a blessing that Israel, that is Jacob, gives to Joseph's son, guess who? Ephraim. Remember, it's Ephraim that's gone. He's quoting, I'm going to show it to you, he's quoting from a blessing that is given to Ephraim. This happens in Genesis chapter 48. Now, Genesis chapter 48, Jacob slash Israel is blessing Joseph's kids. Now, remember, who was the firstborn? Manasseh. So, who was secondborn? Ephraim. So, if you're the firstborn, who gets the primary blessing? Manasseh, the firstborn. Except that when Jacob is blessing Joseph's kids, he places his right hand upon Ephraim. That was the prominent place. And so Joseph gets a little upset with his dad. He says, Dad, well, is there a problem here? This isn't the firstborn. The firstborn is Manasseh. And he he tries to move his hands. Do you remember this? He tries to move his hands in order to bless the right one, which is interesting because Jacob's the one that stole the blessing from his brother. So, hey, Dad, let's get this right, okay? The, The blessing goes on Manasseh. And Jacob refuses. He refuses. And he says, look, I get it. I know, my son, I know. He also, that is Manasseh, Manasseh also will become a people, and he shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother Ephraim shall be greater. His seed shall become a multitude of nations. Now, in your Bible, you probably have a note next to the word multitude because that is not the most natural translation of that Greek term. It should read fullness. His offspring, his seed, shall become the fullness of the goyim. Okay, that's the Hebrew term goyim, which is why it can be translated as either Gentiles or nations. The offspring or the seed of Ephraim shall become the fullness of the nations. Paul quotes that in Romans 11, that the fullness of the nations is the bring, them being brought in is the mechanism by which Ephraim and all 12 tribes will be restored because there was a hardening that came upon God's people by which means they were dispersed into the nations so that they became the nations. There was no distinction anymore. The 10, 12 tribes became the nations just as Israel had blessed Ephraim. That would happen. And Paul says the mission to the Gentiles by which means they are being brought in, in other words, the, tw- the restoration of that which has become the nations is how the 12 northern tribes will be saved. To put it another way, are you with me? All Israel can be saved only through the ingathering of the nations. Paul is simultaneously proclaiming the salvation of the Gentiles and the return of the northern kingdom as the same event. The mission to the Gentiles is how all Israel is saved. And if someone else can tell me how you can save ten tribes that don't exist, I'd love to hear it. Because what Paul is saying is those, 12, those 10 tribes were hardened, they were sent out. They became the nations because that's what the Assyrians did. There is no distinction for the 10 northern tribes, but did God promise to restore them? And he says, is that, is that obvious how he's going to do it? That's why it's a mystery. And here's how he's going to do it. The fullness of the nations he's going to bring in, which is a quote from the blessing placed upon Ephraim, which is how the northern tribes were referred to, that they would become the nations, and Paul says the mission to the Gentiles is how all Israel is saved. Because Jesus is sent out in order to redeem them from all uncleanliness, the covenant will be brought to them, and as the covenant is brought to them and through the restoration, they will be forgiven for their sins, period. I'd love to just go, what questions do you have? (laughs) It's too many of you. But I believe this is the most faithful reading of this text. 
We opened up by saying if we're going to understand readings and how to interpret text, it has to do with the meaning of the author, what Paul meant, and that that meaning is couched within the original author's language and culture that must be supported with evidence. And I would submit to you that we have gone through this. We have seen through the use of the original language, which is then drawn from the Hebrew Scriptures in the way that those words were used in the first century, that this is a faithful reading of what Paul was saying, that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the promises of God to His people, period, full stop, and that you and I live within those benefits as the covenant fulfilled in Christ is extended to you. And through the means of that mission, God is restoring you and fulfilling His promises to restore all Israel as the same thing. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, You are amazing, God. You are amazing. Could could people in Jeremiah's day even imagine this as they looked on with confusion as the prophet was pronouncing the salvation of a people, as it says, Rachel's weeping because the children are gone. And yet, in your wisdom, you have fulfilled and renewed and redeemed that which appeared to be unredeemable. And Lord, we thank you that that same redemption is extended to us. And as we believe on the Lord Jesus, we as well are included in the covenant. We as well are washed clean. We as well have our sins forgiven as we as well are incorporated into the family where we belong to God as we cry out, Abba, Father, as we are given a spirit of adoption and we are made new creatures. We worship you now. We worship you forevermore as our only hope in life and in death. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.